Okay, these notes are on the periodic table. Um, I made a video out of it, so that way hopefully you guys will pay a little bit more attention than if you're just writing down trying to fill in the blanks. Okay, so let's start this now. The periodic table. Okay, the periodic table is organized in a specific manner. A Russian scientist by the name of Dmitry Mendeleev, so this will be your first blank line came up with the first periodic table in 1869, which when you think about it, they didn't have that many elements back in 1869. What, maybe 30, 40, 50, something like that? I don't even think 50. I think it was in the 30s or 40s. But they had very few elements, and yet he managed to come up with a periodic table of sorts. Now, he arranged the elements known at the time in order of increasing atomic mass. Um, atomic numbers were still not known at that time. So they didn't know anything about protons yet um, or neutrons or anything like that. They just knew atomic masses. Okay, he observed that elements in families, um, which on our periodic table, it's the columns that go up and down. Those are families. But he noticed that they appeared at regular periodic intervals. So the periodic table was made so that elements in the same family fell into vertical columns. At first, this did not always happen. Sometimes the next heaviest element did not seem to fit in a certain family. Um, Mendeleev solved that problem by placing the element in a family with similar properties, even if he had to leave a space or two blank. Mendeleev was so sure about his periodic table that he suggested a not yet discovered element and he called it Ica silicon. That means it's sort of like silicon. Um, this element would have properties in between silicon and tin and it was later discovered and named germanium. Yeah, for German. So, pretty cool, huh? He actually predicted germanium. Okay, now there were misfits, okay? But not everybody's perfect. Tellurium is heavier than iodine, yet iodine clearly belonged under bromine and tellurium under selenium, not vice versa. Now, Mendeleev put them there and hoped that maybe the atomic masses were reportedly incorrect, which happened on occasion. Well, of course, obviously, they didn't know about are the number of protons. They didn't know about atomic number. So once those were discovered, they were like, oh, wow, Mendeleev was right. You know, this iodine does belong under bromine and, and tellurium does belong under selenium by way of number of protons. Okay, now let's look at the modern periodic table. Obviously, we don't go by atomic masses anymore. Now, the modern periodic table is similar to Mendeleev's, except that the elements are ordered according to increasing atomic number. So far, there have not been any misfits. Well, that's because we don't have any half protons. You either have one proton or two proton, protons, but you can't have one and a half protons. Um, and the method that we're using is called the periodic law. Now, periodic law states that the properties of the elements are periodic functions of their atomic numbers. Okay, so, oops. Hopefully you guys can still read the letters. The modern periodic table is arranged so that there are vertical columns called groups or families and horizontal rows called periods. Now... Each period ends with a member of the family known as noble gases. I don't know if this is one of the words that you need to underline, but I'm going to put it there anyway. Whoops. Uh, I hate it when I make a mistake like that. Okay, let's try this again. There we go, noble gases. Um, these elements are chemically unreactive. Um, so they always end with a noble gas. Everything in the periodic table ends with a noble gas. Now, there are three classes of elements, and tomorrow we're actually going to color our periodic tables based on these three classes. We have metals, nonmetals, and metalloids. 
Now, metals are located on the left side of the periodic table, non-metals on the right, and the metalloids in between. You can't say metalloids are in the middle because they are not. Metalloids are also on the right-hand side, but they do mark the difference between metals and non-metals. They're the ones that are halfway between. They kind of have properties of metals and properties of non-metals. Okay, so if we look at it, and this is basically what our periodic table is going to look like, only you can use whatever color you want. But tomorrow we are going to be coloring it one of those four, not the first one, but either the second, third, or the fourth one, whichever one you didn't cover color by blocks, we are going to color by metals. All these ones in blue are metals. All the ones in this pink color, fuchsia color, are metalloids, and all of the yellow ones are so we got here non-metals so we've got our metals here and it's hard to read metals um the metalloids metalloids are the pink ones and your non-metals are the yellow ones okay i don't know what that's doing there Okay, so all the ones in blue, all the metals are the ones in blue. So these are blue, pink, so we got, here, we got them in blue, pink, or in this case red, and then the yellow, which I don't have a yellow right now. Okay, so that's what your periodic table is going to look like. Okay, so let's talk about properties of metals. First off, metals are excellent conductors of heat and electricity. Well, think about it. Copper wire. Why do you think we use copper wire? It conducts electricity. Um, iron skillets. Iron skillets are very good because they conduct heat. So most of your, your cookware on the stove, a lot of it's metal some of its glass glass also conducts but metals if it's going to be just a one of the metals metalloids or metal or non-metals it's a metal most have excuse me most have luster that means they're shiny some there are some metals that are brittle though a few of them um not too sure which ones i think there's one or two that are um some metals are ductile they can be pulled into wire um, some metals are malleable, hammered into sheets. All metals lose at least one electron in a chemical reaction. And in fact, metals only lose electrons. We will talk about that when we get to ionic and covalent bonding. So just know that they lose at least one electron. Okay, let's look at nonmetals. Nonmetals are a little different. In fact, they're the opposite. They are poor conductors of electricity, poor conductors of heat. Some are gases, some are solids, and one is a liquid at room temperature. So they cover all three states, whereas metals, you won't find a single metal that's a gas. Now, you will find one metal that's a liquid, and that's mercury. All the rest are solid. Um, and then nonmetals will gain electrons or share electrons in a chemical reaction. Okay. Now let's look at metalloids. Metalloids basically have properties of both metals and non-metals. And their reactivity depends on the properties of the other elements. So sometimes it acts like a metal, sometimes it acts like a non-metal. They are very good semiconductors. In other words, they conduct electricity, but not as readily as a metal. That's why they're called semiconductors. They're great for electronics. You don't want too much electricity going through there. So it conducts some electricity. So it's a semiconductor. Okay, now the elements are broken down into two other categories. We have representative elements and transition elements. So if you look at representative elements, those are elements in group 1, 2, and 13 to 18, and then the transition elements in group 3 through 12. Representative elements use only their valence electrons in chemical reactions. Transi transition elements use more than their valence electrons. In fact, they go into that D shell. 
Okay, so let's look at the states of the elements. We can also figure out what state an element is naturally at room temperature by looking at the periodic table. Now, most periodic tables give different colors to different states. So, I would love for you to look at the one on the black on the backboard, but since we're still working on the symbols and names, nah, I'm not going to uncover it. But just know that they're colored usually by solid, liquid, or gas. Just like this one. Now, if you look at this one, all the ones in yellow are solid. Look how many solid elements they are. Most of them, I'd say, but that's what, about 95% of the elements on the periodic table are solid. There are only two liquid ones. And I would actually kind of know these. It might be helpful. But there are only two liquid ones. One of them is a metal, and that's mercury. Whoops. And the other one is a non-metal, and that's bromine. Now, you got this whole line of gases over here. Now, notice they're all non-metals, but they're all the noble gases, hence the name noble gases. And then you have four other gases. So that's, that's it. Well, and then hydrogen, so five other gases. Everything else is a solid. Now, as I said in the notes, there are only two elements in the liquid state, bromine and mercury. All of the gaseous elements, except hydrogen, are found to the right of the periodic table. The rest are solids. Okay. So we have hit the end of our notes. No, there's no practice problems because there's no problems on this. Tomorrow we are going to color the periodic table, metals, metalloids, and non-metals. Um, hopefully next week we get to do our lab, and we're basically going to test the properties of certain materials, and you're going to tell me whether it's a metal, non-metal, or a metalloid based on its properties. Okay, well, have a good night. Bye.